119. We'll pray for these at the end of the devotion. But Psalm 119, we're in verse 161. We're looking at verse 161 to 168 as we continue now and are close to finishing up Psalm 119. It's hard to believe we're almost here. Uh, this journey began a while ago, uh, back earlier in the year, before the summertime. And we've just been going through Psalm 119, these eight verses at a time, split up in these different sections uh, according to the Hebrew alphabet. And so tonight we're beginning in verse 161, and we'll read through 168. There the Bible says, Princes have persecuted me without a cause, but my heart standeth in all of thy word. I rejoice at thy word as one that findeth great spoil. I hate and abhor lying, but thy law do I love. Seven times a day do I praise thee because of thy righteous judgments. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Lord, I have hoped for thy salvation and done thy commandments. My soul hath kept thy testimonies, and I love them exceedingly. I have kept thy precepts and thy testimonies, for all my ways are before thee. Tonight the message is this, persecution, praise, and peace. Three words that should resonate with every one of us this evening. Let's pray and ask the Lord's help in this message. Father, thank you for the time that we have together tonight. I pray that you would just uh, help us to see from this portion of Psalm 119 exactly what we need to hear. And uh, we'll give you the praise and honor for all that happens. Speak to hearts, change lives, and Lord, thank you again for the blessings that we've received, your goodness and your graciousness to us. And then, Lord, we also come before your throne boldly asking for you to intervene in all these requests that have been made. But speak to us now for these next few moments, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. You've probably experienced like I have, that the Christian life is never a perfect ascension with no obstacles and no diversions or other disruptions. I usually plan it out that way in my brain. In my head, I never see the obstacle. I never see the diversion. I never see the pitfall or the problem. It's always just going to go perfect. And maybe that is good. Hopefully it means I'm somewhat of an optimist in my brain. I can be extremely pessimistic as well, but when I'm, when I'm desiring to see something come about in my life, I just see it happening, and I don't foresee all the other things that are going to come in and are going to disrupt. Uh, but that's how life is, isn't it? Life doesn't go in a perfect 45-degree trajectory up and up and up and up to the top. I, I would love it if it happened that way. But you know and I know that that's not life. Regardless, we have to continue forward for the Lord, come what may. And in this shin portion of Psalm 119, we see the psalmist approach to life as he experienced it. It wasn't always easy, and he had to deal with persecution as we see tonight. And yet, he learned how to praise the Lord, and he learned how to find true and lasting peace in the midst of all of it. So what do we learn from this passage that we can apply to our lives also? Now, we'll just take a few moments, and I hope it'll be a help to us. Here's the first thought. We see persecution. In verse 161, the psalmist says, Princes have persecuted me without a cause. Uh, in verse 163, he says, I hate and abhor lying. I kind of think that those two phrases are connected. Princes that have persecuted and then lying, all these things, I think, at least in the psalmist's mind, fit together. And we see that this psalmist is being persecuted. Uh, we already saw it coming in uh, previous verses, and now it seems as though he's in the midst of it and he's being persecuted, the Bible says, by princes. I've written down here next to it in parentheses, the powers that be. Powerful people in posi positions of influence and power that are persecuting the psalmist. And he says, for good measure, uh, he, he says they've done it without a cause. 
It'd be one thing if you were receiving retribution for something you had done wrong. However, he's saying, I am being persecuted, and there's no good reason for it. There's no cause for it. I don't deserve this. <laughs> Ever feel that way? Ever feel that way from the powers that be? That's how he felt. Notice, we need to be prepared for when the ruling class stands against us and persecutes us in a number of different ways. Now, we're on cloud nine tonight, at least I think we all are, from what it sounded like. We're all elated at the results, and we're just thinking everything's great. The old Virginia that uh, we've known and loved from, you know, years gone by seems like it's back and better than ever, and, and so there's a lot of excitement. But I want to tell you, and I'm not trying to pop the balloon, I'm not trying to let the air out of the balloon, but I guess I am a little bit, we understand things don't always stay the same way. And, and we've just come through a season of over 10 years, of over a decade in our state, when it's not been like this at all. And we know what it's been like to be kind of where the psalmist is. And I just mentioned that to help us with something. Just be prepared for it. Just be prepared for it. Now, I'm, I'm hoping we have a wonderful four years like our state has never seen or known. But be pre prepared for what comes after that, whatever it is. Because we still are despised by many of those in positions of power who hate our God and therefore they hate us. Now, that's not me just being a kind of a, a negative preacher, that's what the Bible says. We're despised by our connection to Jesus. I forgot to give verses out tonight. Can someone turn to John 15, 18? Can I get a, a man tonight to turn there and read John 15, 18 for me? All right, Tate, and I'm going to give the rest of them out too. Can I get another gentleman to read 1 Peter 4, 12? All right, Chick, and then uh, Nehemiah 8, 10, Rob. All right, I think those are the three I needed to give out. But we're despised just by our connection to Jesus. We are despised. So loud and clear, Tate, read for me John 15, 18. Those are the words of Jesus. If the world hates you, and it does, know that the world hates you. It's because it hated me first, Christ says. We are hated by the world, in many uh, situations, by those who are in power, because of our connection to Christ. And we just need to understand that. Now again, this isn't on our mind, and I'm not trying to get us all down in the dumps. I am just helping us with something. Be always ready for persecution. And when I say persecution, I'm not talking about being thrown to lions. At least not yet. <laughs> uh, I'm not talking about uh, being locked up, at least not yet. But it, it could get close to that. We, we've seen some very uncertain and unstable times. And so we need to be prepared because persecution in some way, shape, or form is always the way of the Christian. And it's always been that way for God's people. God's people are hated by the world, and therefore there's always going to be some kind of persecution on some level that we're dealing with or we'll, we'll deal with in our life just by our connection to Jesus Christ. Isn't it interesting how you say the name Jesus and people get angry? You can say Muhammad and people just let it go. They might, be, might even celebrate it. You can talk about other leaders, religious leaders, Confucius or Buddha, and, and everyone just thinks that's grand and fine. But when you say Jesus, people get irritated and angry because there is a rejection of Jesus as God in the heart of many. And, and therefore, when the name of Jesus is said, there's a, there's a rejection to that. We will be despised by our connection to Jesus. And throughout history, God's people have had to endure persecution. So, 
We shouldn't be shocked by it when it happens. Uh, who has First Peter 4.12? Think it not strange of the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Uh, Sometimes the persecution comes from people. Sometimes it just results from living life. And we might say to ourselves, Lord, are you trying to hurt me? Why am I going through this? Why am I experiencing this? Why is life so difficult? And, And the Lord's helping us here when he says, don't think it's strange as though some strange thing happened to you. This is a part of life, number one, but even beyond that, living the Christian life, especially for the Christian life, trials and tribulations and persecutions especially is just a part of it. And what I like about this portion of Psalm 119 is that we do see the psalmist mentioning his persecution, but he also just says, I'm dealing with it. You see, in, one, in verse 161, he says, Princes have persecuted me without a cause. But then he says, But my heart standeth in all of thy word. Uh, he, he says in verse 163, I hate and abhor lying, but thy law do I love. And what he's saying is, I'm in the middle of some difficulty, but I love the word of God. I'm going through some hard times, but my heart is still in all of God and his word. And all that I'm learning and all that God is helping me with and showing me and teaching me. So we see persecution. And I'm glad I got that out of the way first because I don't think we're out of a, of a persecuted mindset tonight. And I don't want to try to get us negative. But it is important for us to know. Secondly, we see praise. Praise. Now there's the more of the mindset that I've sensed this evening. Notice what he says in verse 162. I rejoice at thy word as one that findeth great spoil. Verse 164, seven times a day do I praise thee because of thy righteous judgments. Regardless of the persecution, the psalmist rejoices and praises the Lord. No matter what he was facing, he was rejoicing. He still rejoices. He could rejoice over the treasure of God's word in such times. When he says, as one that findeth great spoil, he's, he's speaking of treasure. He says, I have found a great treasure in life, and the treasure trove is in the Scripture. It's in the Word of God, and it helps me right where I am. It gives me right what I need, and it's perfect just at the right moment in time. Remember something about rejoicing. The Bible tells us in Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 10 that the joy of the Lord is your what? Strength. Who has Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 10? There's a lot of great truth in that verse. I first love that Nehemiah said, and these were the words of God, you know, giving the the message, eat the fat and drink the sweet. That's biblical. So a big old steak and a Coke, is it's, it's right. You're being right with God when you have that every once in a while. He says, eat the fat and drink the sweet. And then he goes on and he says, listen, the joy of the Lord is your strength. It's the joy of the Lord that gets you through. It's the joy of the Lord that makes you strong. It's the joy of the Lord that makes all the difference in your life. And yes, when things are going wrong and life is kind of coming apart at the seams and you don't know where to go or what to do or how it's going to happen or how it's all going to work out and things don't look so good at the moment, it's the joy of the Lord that people will see. And it's the joy of the Lord that gives you strength. And it's the joy of the Lord that helps you. I hope that over the past year and a half and and all that we've been through, I hope that we've still been able to show the joy of the Lord. It's a little convicting for me to say that because I don't think I always do that. Uh, Sometimes I get irritated. Sometimes I get frustrated. And, uh, And I don't know that I'm always demonstrating the joy of the Lord as I'm going through those moments, but I should, and you should. All of us should show the joy of the Lord every day, 
It should be seen in us, and it should be so clearly evident, and I'm not talking about in a disingenuous way, but it should be so clearly evident in a genuine, real way that people feel as though it's infectious. That, boy, that person's so joyful. Maybe I should be more joyful. That person's smiling all the time. Maybe I should smile a little bit more. Maybe I should, you know, try to be an encouragement or be a help or be a blessing. Uh, maybe I should stop being such a sour puss and uh, start being someone who's going to be a help and be a, uh, an edifier and be someone who lifts up instead of tears down. It's the joy of the Lord that is our strength. We see persecution, we see praise, and then finally we see peace. I love verse 165. It's a very familiar passage, but there the verse says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. There's a peace that comes over the psalmist. He had been persecuted, yet he could praise in the persecution. But it wasn't all just crazy persecution or praising in the midst of it. There was, a, there was a real inner peace that he had. There was a calmness and an inner contentment that he had regardless of whatever it was he was facing. We see that our peace is directly related to our love for God's Word. If you have a love for the Word of God, you will be a peaceful person. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Oh, how our culture needs to hear that. How our society needs to hear that. Because so many are so offended by absolutely everything. Am I right? Everybody is offended by everything. And uh, that's kind of been the state of things for a while now. But for the Christian, it should be the exact opposite. We should be a peaceful people. It should be a people that it's really hard for us to get angry. It's hard for us to get worked up emotionally. Because we have a real peace that exists. So that nothing can offend us. Nothing can offend us. I think it was the old preacher... Uh, down there in North Carolina, Brother Bobby Robertson, and I, I think uh, he tells a story of how he was with, um, I can't remember the old preacher of yesteryear, but he was with one of the old preachers from a long time ago, and uh, he tells a story about how he was with this preacher, and he got to cutting up and joking about something, and, uh, and he said to this old-time evangelist that he was driving in a car with, he said, you know, I'm, I'm sorry about what I just said there, because I think he got carried away and maybe a joke that he told or something that just kind of maybe was right on the edge. And uh, Brother Robertson said that he apologized uh, to this evangelist, and he said, hey, you can't offend me. You can't offend a dead man. And he said, what do you mean a dead man? He said, I'm, I'm dead. I'm supposed to be dead to everything. And uh, I'm supposed to be dead to uh, compliments, dead to criticism, uh, dead to offense. Uh, I'm supposed to be alive in Christ, dead to the old natural man. And he says, if you've been offensive in what you've said, you can talk to the Lord about it, but, but you can't offend someone who's dead to the flesh. I, I think that's how we should try to live, to be dead to that which would cause an offense, to that, that part of us that wants to latch on to something and get worked up, get angry, maybe get sad, or maybe become bitter. If we love the Word of God, it will help us not to become that way. Notice, our peace is also related to loving God's law. And our professed love is proved by our obedient actions. Notice the last three verses. In one first, uh, 166, he says, Lord, I have hoped for thy salvation and done thy commandments. There's an act of obedience. Verse 167, my soul hath kept thy testimonies, and I love them exceedingly kept thy testimonies, there's a second act of obedience. He says it again in verse 168, I have kept thy precepts and thy testimonies, for all my ways are before thee. And I've already mentioned this, so I won't take uh, really long with this at all, but we speak so much of loving God and his word, but talk is cheap. You can tell someone all day long that you love them, but until you prove that you love them, until your actions show otherwise, you're not really demonstrating love. And we should say I love you. But we had better back up what we say and demonstrate our love. 
We should tell God that we love him, but we had better live in such a way that we're keeping his law, keeping his commandments that prove what we say. And uh, I'll leave you with that. Uh, In this world, we'll have some difficulty and persecution. However, we can praise God and we can have peace through it all. And I hope that we'll remember that in the rest of our days. That's that's it tonight, but I want to uh, take about 10 minutes Find someone to pray with. You can pray with your family. You can pray with some people next to you. Let's get in groups of two, three, or four, and uh, we'll pray.